they were going to start a new book called The Mystery of Cabin Island, and it's a Hardy Boy mystery. And the Hardy Boys have been around for about 90 years or so when they first started writing stories about them. They, he, um, and uh, there are something like 56 or 57 Hardy Boy books. So this is just one of a number. Chapter one, Threat on Cabin Island. What a reward, Joe Hardy exclaimed. You mean we can stay at Cabin Island over the winter vacation? Right, starting the day after Christmas, said Frank. The whole place is ours. And Mr. Jefferson says he'll throw another mystery our way. About what? Wouldn't say. He'll tell us at his home tomorrow when we get the key. The Hardy boys were elated over their good luck. The young detectives recently had broken a car theft ring, and in gratitude for the return of his automobile, Elroy Jefferson, a wealthy resident of Bayport, had made the offer of his private retreat near the entrance to Barmet Bay. Impulsive, blonde-haired Joe snapped his fingers. Frank, let's call Chet and Biff and take our ice boat over to the island. I'd like to give it a quick preview. Okay, you can meet him at our dock. Dark-haired Frank, 18 and a year older than Joe, was just as eager to set foot on Cabin Island and also to skim over the ice, now glossy smooth after a long siege of zero weather. Joe dashed to the hall telephone and dialed the number. See, you can tell it's kind of um, an older story because that was back when telephones weren't cell phones. You had to actually have them up to a wall and to some wires and things in order to make phone calls, which is how it was when I was a, a girl too. Joe dashed to the hall telephone and dialed the number of the Morton farmhouse. In a moment, he was speaking to Chet Morton, a beefy teammate on the Bayport High football 11. What's up? The stout youth asked. Get your long johns on, Joel told him. We're going to whip out to Cabin Island on the seagull. That wind on the bay will really start your blood circulating. So it's kind of like an ice race boat. Um, that would be exciting. Frank and Joe had designed and built the ice boat during the previous summer. They had saved their money to buy materials and had worked slowly and carefully on the project. The craft was made so that it could be taken apart and compactly stored in the boathouse where the brother's motorboat, the sleuth, was also housed. Sounds great, but I don't know, Chet hesitated wistfully. Mom's just mixing a batch of maple fudge. Save it till we get back. Think of the appetite you'll work up, Joe added with a chuckle. Think of your waistline, too. We'll meet you at the boathouse in 20 minutes. Well, okay, as long as you don't go poking into any more mysteries. No promises, pal. Grinning, Joe slammed down the receiver before Chet could object. Moon-faced Chet Morton, who was much fonder of eating and relaxing, than he was of dangerous adventures, was constantly bemoaning the Hardy's habit of becoming involved in crime cases. But the stocky youth was a loyal pal and could always be depended on in a tight spot. After calling Biff Hooper, who agreed to the trip enthusiastically, Joe dressed warmly and hurried outside. Frank was already backing their convertible out of the garage. The Hardys drove to the boathouse on Barmet Bay. Chet and Biff were waiting for them. Biff, a muscular youth whose hobby was amateur boxing, was dancing about, attempting to persuade plump Chet to spar with him. Chet held up his hands to fend off the blows. He grinned as Frank and Joe walked towards them. I'm glad you're here, he exclaimed. This guy is trying to use me for a punching bag. Do you good, Biff rejoined. Get you in shape. Frank laughed. If you keep this up, Cabin Island won't be big enough for both of you and us. He gave them hearty slaps on the back. Let's get going. Joe opened the doors of the boathouse and led the way inside. The seagull was chalked on boards which lay over the ice between the cat catwalks. Suspended above it in a steel cradle was the sleuth. From a gear shelf, the boys took iron pointed creepers and attached them to their boots then donned crash helmets and goggles. As they pulled the ice boat outside, the wind whipped hard at their backs. Joe tilted the brake 
on the outside of the hull so that the point dug firmly into the ice. Ten minutes later, the four had fastened the long runner plank crossways under the bow, raised the mast, and set the sail. Quickly, they climbed into the stern's cockpit. So it's a sailboat, but it's running on ice. Um, and so they've got a, a little rudder that uh, kind of carves into the ice to help keep it stable. Strap yourselves in tight, Frank warned as he took the tiller. That wind's strong and the gull's raring to go, so they use the wind as their motor. He released the brake and the sleek white craft glided swiftly out into the bay, now solidly frozen except for the channel which was kept open by the shipping lines and the coast guard. Cold, clear air stung the boys' faces and they were showered with ice chips from the bow, from the bow runner. They waved to friends who were skating near shore. Where is Cabin Island anyway, Biff called to the Hardys. In a cove off of the bay, Frank shouted as he guided the seagull in a swooping half circle around a hole that had been cut in the ice by a fisherman. Ever been there before? Chet asked, straining to get his words out against the cold air that whipped across his face. Joe shook his head. We've never tried to take our motorboat into that cove. It's shallow and you'd rip the hull unless you knew for sure where every rock is. But we shouldn't have any trouble now. Presently, the ice boat swooped up the inlet. We'll go around for a look-see, said Frank. Skillfully, he circled the heavily wooded island. The shoreline facing the bay dropped off in, a, in an icy cliff, but the side opposite the mainland road, the bayport, sloped gradually. At the edge of the shore, Frank spotted a tall pine. Let's land there, he said. He pulled the speeding craft into a wide semicircle opposite the tree. The sails slackened and the ice boat slowed up, then drifted straight to the pine where Frank put on the brake and Joe last lashed the craft to the tree. That really would be a pretty nifty way to get around in the wintertime. Right on the nose, Biff said admiringly as they clambered ashore. The four started up the hill. Soon they glimpsed the cabin, perched in a clearing on the highest point of the island. Joe stopped abruptly and pointed to a set of large boot prints in the light snow. How can anyone else be here, he asked. There's no other ice boat around, and it'd be a long, slippery walk from the mainland. Frank shrugged. I doubt that person is still here. It hasn't snowed for a week, so those prints could have been made several days ago. But they only lead upward, Joe observed. There are none going back down the hill. Well, maybe whoever he was went down another way, Frank suggested. The boys resumed their ascent. As they approached the cabin, a broad-shouldered figure in a plaid Mackinac coat appeared from behind a clump of brush and strode towards them. He was a surly looking man in his early thirties who walked with his neck thrust forward. His off balance lumbering gait amused Joe, but the man's words were not funny. Get off this island, he shouted. The Hardys were taken by surprise, but only for seconds. Who says, Joe retorted. I say so and I'll show you, came the reply as the man thrust his right hand into the Mackinac's deep pocket strode closer, glaring at the foursome. Don't threaten us, Biff said angrily, cocking his right fist. If it's a fight you want, Frank said coolly, the odds are one to four, so don't be foolish. Side, we have permission to be on this island. The hostile man hesitated, looking from face to face. What makes you think I don't have permission to, he asked. Then the stranger made the mistake of advancing a step farther. Biff fainted with a quick left hand and sent his right fist into the man's midriff. With an oof, the man sat heavily in the snow and then scrambled to his feet, muttering threats. Ah, knock it off, said Chad. We won't get anywhere arguing with him, Frank said. Come on. The boys turned and retraced their steps to the seagull. Frank and Joe kept glancing back, but the hostile stranger did not follow. Back in the ice boat, Joe said, I wonder if Mr. Jefferson knows that man and gave him permission to come to Cabin Island. I doubt it, said Frank. So maybe this has something to do with the mystery. Some welcoming committee, Chet grumbled. Joe scowled. He sure was eager to chase us away. 
I have a hunch he's up to no good. Soon Frank guided the seagull out of the cove and sent her skimming along Barmat Bay. Suddenly Chet gasped, look at that ice boat. Must be a crazy man steering it. Heading toward them was a large craft which weaved across the ice in a dizzying path. Suddenly it dipped over and one runner plank lifted off the ice into the air. Wow, that's a tall hike, exclaimed Frank. He'll capsize, Biff, Biff cried out. Just then the pilot let go the sheet and the runner came down hard, splattering ice. Joe groaned. Anybody who gives a boat that slime bang treatment doesn't deserve to own one. Here's some pictures that kind of show you what the ice boats look like. You can see they've got the um, legs sticking out with the skimmers on either side. And then the sails in the wind are what steer them along. along. An instant later, the other craft streaked straight for the seagull. Frank looked grim. We're in trouble, he said. That's the hawk. The hawk was owned by two belligerent youths, Tad Carson and Ike Nash, who had been in the Hardy's classes at school until they had dropped out early in the term. The two often returned to loiter about the school grounds, bullying younger boys. They were known to be fast, reckless car drivers, too. Ike is steering, Joe observed. He's even more dangerous on the ice than he is on the road. If he doesn't change his course, he'll hit us, Chet said. Frank set his jaw. If I won't turn, I will. He bore down on the tiller and swung out of the hawk's path. A second later, the bigger craft also changed course. It was hurtling toward the seagull again, gaining momentum every second. They mean to run us down, Biff shouted. Or else they just want to scare us, Joe said, clenching his fist. Frank swerved once more. Again, the other steersmen mimicked him, and the hawk still came at them. By now, it was less than 50 yards away. The boys could see mocking grins on Ike and Tad's faces. In another few seconds, the hawk would crash into the seagull. Suddenly, Ike's grin changed to a look of terror. In a flash, Frank realized what had happened. The reckless, reckless youth had tried to swerve off the collision course, course but the maneuver had caused the hawk's tiller to jam. Ike held up his hands to show that he had lost control of his craft. In a moment, the boats would collide. Well, that's a pretty exciting chapter one. They get in a fight with a stranger, and they've got some bad boys in a big boat trying to run them over. So we'll find out more next time.